Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a This Year in Perfume ranked video. And I love doing these videos because it's a great way to just talk about a lot of fragrances in a little bit of a unique fashion. So um, we've got a fun video, I think. I actually am surprised by how many uh, fragrances I have from the year 1993. There are actually 18 full bottles that we're going to discuss ranked in this video. So that should be fun. But first, before we do that, uh, as always, we are going to do our customary scent of the day. And um, scent of the day, actually, this has been a little bit of a sad week for um, fragrance lovers because we found out earlier in the week that Olivier Peugeot had passed away. He was sort of a big star in the perfume world. He did a lot of fantastic fragrances, and this is one of them. And I'm wearing this as my scent of the day, sort of in honor of him. And this is 34 Boulevard Saint Germain from uh, Diptyque. Sorry about the dust. But um, he's done some pretty amazing fragrances for Diptyque. He did some Parfum de Marly fragrances. He's done a lot of work. And um, he did Versace's. He's done a lot of stuff. So go check out my video on him if you want to learn more about what he did and his contribution. And I know that he will live on through his uh, creations. And so I'm wearing, I'm wearing this today as my scent of the day in honor of Olivier Peugeot. Uh, and really, you know, what's interesting, I wore this to the office today, obviously dressed like this. And um, this is a very good modern perfume. For somebody who's looking for something that's modern, you could go with the EDT, which came out in 2011, or you could go with the EDP, which is what I have in my hand right here, that came out in 2018. It's sort of this very uh, modern sandalwood, which sounds like I would hate it because there's some sweetness here, but he actually navigates it pretty good. It's a, it's a modern sandalwood vanilla scent that um, is just so likable. Everyone seems to really like this scent, and yet, I don't hate it. Usually the stuff everyone else likes, I hate. But uh, in this case, I actually like this fragrance. I would uh, love to get the EDT one day as well. I'll do a full review on 34 Boulevard Saint Germain and a beautiful presentation from Diptyque. I usually don't care about the presentation, but it's got the magnetic cap, and, um, you know, it, uh, it, it, it almost looks like one of their candles. Uh, and actually, the EDT actually looks like the uh, atomizer tube is a wick of the candle. So, very cool presentation. And actually, this would make an amazing candle. Uh, good stuff. So, I've really enjoyed wearing it, albeit under somewhat sad circumstances. Okay, so that's my scent of the day. So, we're going to do a quick unboxing because my good friend Rudy um, did a video where he said he was selling some stuff. And he gave me very, very fair prices on these. And actually, so I really couldn't say no. Um, so this is from Rudy's collection. One is something I've been hunting for a very long time, and I really didn't know when I was going to get another chance to buy it at a fair price from, you know, a place that I knew was in good hands, let's say. Uh, but first, let's do the cheapie from the list. So the cheapie that I ended up picking up from him is a um, 30 mil bottle of Ted Lapidus Creation. And you can see this is sort of one of the older bottles by the packaging. This is actually discontinued altogether. They don't make this anymore. This was a women's perfume. And the thing about Ted Lapidus though for me is distributed by French Fragrances Inc. So the thing about Ted Lapidus for me is their fragrances punch way above their weight class. You know, you would not expect some of their fragrances to smell the way that they do. And so this is a blind buy for me, but it's something that I wanted to, um, you know, I wanted to give some limelight to. So let me tell you a little bit about this perfume. So the box is going to go into the attic with all the other boxes. I can't fight boxes every time I want to open a bottle. So there is the bottle. And actually really pretty bottle. Um, it's got this cream colored cap cheap atomizer, which is sort of what you would expect from these budget fragrances of the day. But this came out in my favorite decade, in the, um, in the mid eighties. Um, and it is creation, 1984 came out. Uh, this is the vintage. They then re-released it in 2011, which I've never smelled, but this version is discontinued. Uh, so it's sort of like a floral sheep rope. Passion fruit, peach, black currant, mango, a lot of fruits in the top. 
with um, green galbanum and then a big floral heart, tuberose, gardenia, jasmine, stuff like that, uh, with a base of oak moss, vetiver, musk, patchouli, sandalwood, vanilla, and amber. Probably um, a little too floral for my taste day to day, but this will make a fun fragrance to sort of explore and get to know and talk about with you guys. And if you can find this like I did for, you know, 20, 25 bucks, no brainer. Absolutely no brainer. Um, so thank you, Rudy, for being very fair with that one. And then the one that I am most excited about, because these are just almost impossible to find um, because so many people are now looking for them. Let me pick up some of this mess I made here. Okay, so since so many people are looking for them, this is Leather Oud, but not just any Leather Oud. This is actually a 2015 version of Leather Oud, 5W 1A1 is the batch code, and so you can see that this is before the C and the D were sort of put together in the new Dior logo, um, and many people uh, have said that Leather Oud suffered a bit of a reformulation whenever it went to this version. This is a 2018 bottle, so this will be a hell of a comparison video for me to do. I can do the vintage um, pre demashi reformulation versus the new demashi reformulation because for those of you that don't know, um, basically what uh, LVMH implored demashi to do one of the reasons that they paid him was that they really wanted him to um, save Dior money. That was a big thing. LVMH is always about saving money, right? And so what they did is they actually had them reformulate their own fragrances. So they used a GCMS machine and um, tried to sort of cut the oil houses out of the equation so they didn't have to give royalties to Maine or Takasago, Givaudan, whoever it was. And... Um, you know, they basically keep everything in-house. So they wanted to be vertically integrated, sort of like how Chanel is vertically integrated. They wanted to have the same sort of idea where they controlled everything from the production, owning the fields, all the way to the final end product and all that good stuff. And that's exactly what Demashi did for them. And whenever he did the reformulation, there are people that say that it changed. The scent changed on some of these privés. It's not the same. You want to go for the older one. Now, I must confess, I really like um, this version of Leather Oud. So I may just be in a situation where I now have a backup, or if there really is that big of a difference, I may just keep the 2015 bottle and sell this off to somebody one day. Um, but but we'll see about that. But thank you, uh, Rudy, for, for being fair and finding this for me. Uh, can't wait to sort of get to know it and do this comparison video for you guys. Okay, so that is the big buy from my good friend Rudy. So you'll go up in the attic, leather oud box. You'll go over here. Okay, so we've done scent of the day. We did the unboxing. Let's get into this uh, this year in perfume episode from uh, 1993. 1993 is an interesting year um, because you would think that it's a year that I just would not really be as interested in, but in reality, it falls more into the end of the 80s, early 90s for me than it does the aquatic wave, which is coming. The aquatic wave is coming very, very soon to wash everything away. And, um, but I still have 18 fragrances from 1993. So let's talk a little bit about some history uh, in 1993, some, some things that happened. So setting the mood, if you will, for this video. So Czechoslovakia officially splits into the Czech Republic and Slovakia. In, in early 1993, um, and there was some, so some of the bigger news, obviously Bill Clinton was sworn into the into office, um, that was the year the Dallas Cowboys beat the Buffalo Bills 52-17, to 17, just an insane uh, butchering of the Bills that day, Janet Reno becomes the first female U.S. Attorney General, um, Groundhog Day came out, Bill Murray and his brilliant movie Groundhog Day uh, came out in February of 
Um, let's see, what else are some major events? Ah, the first World Trade Center bombing. So obviously foreshadowing what was to come in 2001, but uh, basically one of the most major events of the year was the uh, World Trade Center detonation, the bombing that, that uh, I believe six people ended up dying in that. And then the other big news of 1993 was the Waco uh, compound where the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms tried to serve the search warrant. It was a religious uh, branch sect of the, of the Branch Davidians, and a gunfire broke out, and of course, uh, a 51-day siege ended up happening. Um, let's see, what else happened? Um... I'm trying to skip over the small stuff. Let's see. Um, so usually I have like a high level sort of overview, but I, I pulled up something that was really, really detailed here. And I don't want to go into super detail, but apparently there's a big space shuttle mission. And um, oh, let's see. What else happened? What else happened? I thought there was something with... Um, I thought I saw that there was something, there was some other big news I wanted to talk about. Uh, let's see, let's go to May. Well, we may have to skip it. I'm not seeing it, and I don't want to read each each little one of these. This is a really detailed list of things that happened in, in 1993. Pizza, the Pizza Hut blimp crashed. That's pretty crazy. Um, into an apartment building, too. Imagine sitting in an apartment building and having a blimp crash on you. That would not be fun. Um, what else happened? Let's go to August. Let's see if I can scour this quickly here. The first known reference to Y2K is published. Jesus, that's early. Uh, they were already, they were already, uh, Pulling that out in 1993. That was still that was still so far away. I can't believe that. Uh, let's see. What else? What else happened? Oh, apparently there's a really big earthquake in India. 28,000 people killed. That's a lot. Um, that's a lot of people to die in an earthquake. That's very sad. And let's see. River Phoenix dies, 27 years old, on the sidewalk of a popular West Hollywood nightclub from a drug overdose. Really sad. I really liked River Phoenix. Um, <clears throat> Snoop Dogg releases Doggy Style. Schindler's List came out that year. Um, President Clinton signs the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act. And, uh, let's see. Ah, there it is. Notorious drug lord Pablo Escobar is gunned down by police in Colombia. That was December. I had to make it all the way to December. Damn it, I made it. Okay, so that gives you an idea. Ah, and Doom was released. If you're a kid, or if you were a kid when I was a kid, or, you know, you enjoyed gaming, Doom was, like, one of the greatest games of all time. Um, first person... PC shooter video game Doom released in 1993. Okay, so that sets the scene of what was going on in 1993. So let's get into uh, these these fragrances again. When I rank these, I'm ranking these from you know my personal favorites to wear all the way from you know I'm not saying number one is objectively a better fragrance than number 18 or anything like that. These are just a fun way to talk about a lot of fragrances in a style that's a little different from what you see in the usual top tens. And um, one thing I should mention, though, is as large as my collection is, there's still a lot of fragrances that are on the wish list that I just don't own or I've never smelled before. For example, Guerlain's Jardines de Bagatelle. Bagatelle, I've never smelled before. Um, Lactizan's Velour de Roses, never smelled before. Muir et Musk Extreme by Lactizan, I've never smelled before. So there's still a lot of fragrances on the to sniff list that I just have never smelled before. Serge Luton's uh, Rose de Nuit, that's supposedly one of the greatest rose fragrances. Never smelled that one, don't have it in the collection. Uh, Musk de Cartier 2 by Cartier, I've never smelled before. Uh, so just keep that in mind. This is just a snapshot of some things from my collection. Okay. So let's get started. Number 18 on the list is a fragrance from the house of Animal. 
first fragrance on the list from the house, but not the last. And this is actually a women's targeted fragrance, and it's called Animal Animal. Now, I actually made a mistake in buying this because I did not mean to buy this. I meant to purchase the 1987 Shepra from this house, which is still on my wish list. I have not found a bottle yet, um, but I ended up buying this. And um, I was disappointed at first when I got it because I really wanted the vintage Shepra from the 80s. This is obviously from 1993. It's more of like a fruity floral musk smelling fragrance, but I think it's technically also labeled as a Shepra, but it's much heavier on the freesia, which is a note that um, the House of Animal really liked using in their compositions back then. So there was this note of freesia and citruses and white florals. It smells like there's some jasmine, but there's also a little bit of um, floral peach in here. So it's like this floral peachy um, smell mixed with oak moss in the base. It's actually a really good fragrance. It's not fair that I was so hard on it. I still want the OG from the 80s from this house for women, but that is just on the never-ending wish list. So number 18, Animal, Animal for women from 1993. Number 17 is a house, the only fragrance actually in, the, in my collection from this house, and it's from the house of Biblos, and this is called Biblos for Man, or Biblos pour homme. And this particular version of it is discontinued. I think they tried to reissue a version that is different and it just didn't smell the same. But this is a very interesting citrusy scent because most citrus fragrances for me are kind of boring. This one's not. This is a very interesting take on a citrus that was issued before the great aquatic wave which came a couple years later and sort of washed these type of fragrances away because this still has one foot planted in the 1980s you get old school notes like thyme and artemisia violet leaf and um, tarragon that's a very old school masculine note i love tarragon it gives this sort of anisic quality to uh to the composition it's a very masculine note too, but they did it in a way, obviously they, they could tell that the uh, winds of change were shifting already in 1993. And so what they did is they made the fragrance fresher and they added more citruses. So instead of having this aquatic take on freshness, which came in, in the years coming after, after this came out in 1993, uh, they added this extra um, sort of citrusiness, which normally, if you know me, you know those citrusy, heavy, aromatic fragrances just don't really move me. This one's really good, though. Uh, it's a good take on it because they kept in this very earthy, herbal, heavy patchouli and woods in the base. So yes, you get the citruses, but you also get that one foot in the 80s still with the old school notes like the Artemisia, Tarragon, stuff like that. There is a little bit of herbal lavender in here as well. Um, but then you also get the old school oak moss and patchouli. It's just a really good way to do sort of a spicy, citrusy composition. And I'll review this one day, but uh, also no one hypes this up. So if you're looking for a sort of a summer banger that um, no one else is wearing, if you can find these bottles on the cheap, might be worth checking out. That's Biblos Por Homme or Biblos for Man. Um, at number 17. Number 16. Number 16 on the list is actually another cheapy. So that Biblos Por Homme was a very cheap fragrance. I think I paid less than $20 for that. Uh, this one, I paid about seven bucks a bottle. And uh, I ended up getting like four bottles because they were so cheap. And this is actually the Cosmere version of a Guy La Roche fragrance. If you've seen the Dracar Noir or Dracar bottles, you've seen these bottles before. And you can see that it almost looks like a aquatic looking bottle. And it almost looks like there's this icy water, right? Going all over the bottle. Very cool presentation. And the fragrance itself is a very interesting take on an aquatic. Again, this is an aquatic fragrance. It's labeled as an aquatic fragrance. It has this uh, sea salt like smell. But this is done almost in a similar, um, almost like a similar fashion to something like New West by Aramis. So if you remember how they made New West, it wasn't just aquatic. There were all these other heavier notes in there as well. If you've ever smelled vintage bottles of Aralfa by Creed, same thing. 
you know, it's not just an aquatic fragrance, even though the marketing is sailboats and freshness and all this stuff. There's all these other things in there, right? That's exactly how this fragrance is. Uh, it's an aquatic fresh fragrance on one hand, but on the other hand, there's heavier notes. So you get things like galbanum, artemisia, there's this fennel-like smell in here. Um, there's pimento. There is thyme. So again, it's very herbal. And in the base, you have this cypress note, which has this medicinal, almost healing property to me. Uh, I love cypress in fragrances, and I really wish they used more of it. There's moss. There's oak moss. There's sandalwood. And there's patchouli. And so you can see that even though this is a fresh aquatic fragrance, it's done... You know, when we when we look back on it in 2023, everything back then feels like sort of a vintage style fragrance, if you will. But when I when I think of aquatics, I really think there's two big line in the sands that were done. The early aquatics where they still implemented those sort of traditionally old school masculine uh, notes. And then the newer age aquatics where it really is focusing on smelling like a marine salty, marine, oceanic-like smell, and they leave all of the heavy stuff out. You don't get the patchouli or the woods or the violet leaf or the artemisia or the fennel or, you know, the thyme or all of this stuff, right? You don't get any of that stuff. Here you do. You get the bay leaf, you get the pepper, you get the galbanum, and it's just, it makes the, for me, as someone who is not a lover of aquatic fragrances, these are the type of aquatics that I think are really underrated. And because of the way that the composition is made, there's a little bit of mint and the bay leaf, which has a green facet to it, the galbanum, which has a green facet to it, the mint, which has a green facet to it, the artemisia, which has a green facet to it, and the oak moss in the base, all of those notes sort of play with this very green feel to the fragrance. So people, when they smell this for the first time normally, most people are taken aback by how green it smells because there is that sea salty, aldehydic, you know, oceanic, um, almost ozonic. I would say there's more of an ozonic vibe in this than a true old school, you know, like, or, you know, for here, it would be like more of a modern uh, aquatic for what was coming, things like Aqua de Jo. But um, what's interesting about it is all of the other stuff you get around it. So yeah, Guy La Roche Horizon, especially if you can find these older Cosmere bottles for cheap because no one wants them, like I did, seven bucks, uh, you just can't go wrong. So Horizon by Guy La Roche at number 16. Number 15. Number 15 is a, another discontinued fragrance. So we basically have had uh, four discontinued fragrances to start. Everything we've talked about so far is uh, discontinued, and that trend is unfortunately going to... Con uh, continue here, but um, this is En Sense by Givenchy at number 15. And En Sense by Givenchy to me is Givenchy's attempt at making a modern um, floral heavy masculine. And this fragrance has one problem. And the problem is, is that it reminds me of a fragrance that came out all the way back in 1979 uh, called Nino Ceruti Porom. That fragrance is far superior to this. That's the problem that Ensense has. And while I enjoy Ensense, and I think it is a good perfume, every time I wear it, I'm, I'm asking myself, damn, why didn't I just wear Nino Ceruti Porom? Because Nino Ceruti Porom has this very bitter sort of... Um, bitter green opening and this takes a much uh i would say more indirect route to to getting where it's going i think they're both floral heavy compositions for men this actually has a lot of lily of the valley magnolia and iris which is a really beautiful floral heart with some mastic mastic to me always smells almost like the name sounds mastic you know it's got this gummy feel to it and um, there's also this herbal basil note. And if you've ever smelled this, uh, like if you've ever taken fresh basil and smelled it or, or smelled it once it's cooked down just a little bit, uh, you'll get that sort of very herbal green um, mixed with the black currant. And the black currant here just adds this fruity playfulness to it. This is a very playful fragrance. And yet they tried to balance out the masculinity by putting some fir balsam in the base. And Daniel... 
Moliere is the perfumer who made this in 1993. This was a commercial flop, apparently. Not many people ended up flocking to this because 1993 for me is like this transition year. It's like I was mentioning earlier with Biblos. Um, Biblos, they could see the winds shifting and they knew they needed to make a fragrance fresher, but they didn't really know how. And so they were still using old school tactics uh, for 1993 anyways. You know, they were using the herbal lavender, the uh, tarragon and nutmeg and thyme and artemisia and all that stuff. And I think Givenchy's, let's say, marketing team or creative directors at the time, you know, they were looking at this and saying, they were seeing the same landscape. Hey, the winds are shifting. You know, people are buying things like New West or Cool Water. How do we compete in that sphere? And their idea was actually quite ingenious was to make a masculine floral, to try to do something different off the beaten path. Now, it didn't work, um, but you have to give them kudos for trying, and they made a pretty damn good fragrance in the meantime. So, very floral, green, playful, spicy, masculine um, scent from Givenchy on Sensei. And and this is one of those where uh, it's, it's discontinued, and you'll go on eBay, and you'll see some fool asking $250 or $350 for this. Don't pay that. Uh, I think FragranceBuy.ca had bottles recently for like 50 bucks. They pop up from time to time, um, but be patient. You'll find a good deal on that one. Okay, so that was number 15. Number 14 is a Hugo Boss fragrance that I thought I was actually going to really love, and it's the first Hugo Boss fragrance that let me down. And because you have to remember, before this came out, you had Hugo Boss number one from 85, my favorite honey fragrance of all time. Then you had Hugo Boss Sport, uh, which came out a year or two later. My, one of my favorite sport fragrances of all time. Then you had Boss Spirit from 89. Huge hit. Um, Boss just, in the masculine market, it was like home run, home run, home run. They just went three for three. And so the first time I ever, I blind bought this, by the way. First time I ever smelled this, I was very disappointed. Because when you're comparing it, in my mind, to Boss's previous releases, it's a letdown. This is a little bit of a letdown. But if you give it a chance and you sort of continue to keep an open mind and wear it, I really feel like um, like Boss and many of these companies, obviously, they were in similar situations because smelling this, it feels like Hugo Boss was going through a very similar set of circumstances as was being discussed in, let's say, the boardroom of all these other houses because the one thing that really put me off with Boss Elements is there's this weird uh, freshness to the perfume. So it's the, the fragrance is actually marketed as an earthy, spicy, woody, leathery. There's a leather note in the base of, of Hugo Boss Elements, or there's supposed to be a leather note. And... Um, but I, I don't really get much of it. I don't get much leather at all. Instead, I get much more of this sort of um, artificial freshness. And I'm not sure really where that's coming from. There is a note of plum in here, which is quite nice. So the plum with that, with that freshness that they're trying to impart, although it just didn't feel like they knew how. You know, they were in a very similar bind as some of the previous uh, fragrances I discussed. They used thyme, juniper, tarragon, you know, some of my favorite old school notes, but instead of really going old school, like we're going to, once we get to number one, I'll show you exactly what I mean by going old school with the composition. Uh, that's just my kind of fragrance. It's the kind of thing that I like. Again, it's like they're tiptoeing around, you know, they're being very timid uh, because they knew tastes were changing and they knew that everything had to be a little bit fresher, but I really don't know if they knew how to get there. So they ended up putting out something like this, which it's not a bad fragrance in and of itself. I wear this in the heat. So for me, this is a summer fragrance because of that sort of freshness. The spicy woodiness will remind you a little bit of, you know, the way that uh, Roco Bar sort of comes across. But Roco Bar is much more grounded and it feels like there's more of a plot. This feels like, you know, maybe you're sort of reading along, but you just don't know the plot. doesn't make sense. Um, it's, it's not that it's a bad fragrance. I enjoy wearing it. I just... Man, I expected so much more from Hugo Boss after those first three releases, and this is where everything took a turn, and then once uh, Boss Bottled came out, it was it was all always lost from the house of Hugo Boss as far as I'm concerned, but uh, no matter what they come out with, no one can take away 
those first three fragrances they released. Just all-star fragrances right out of the gate. So that's uh, Hugo Boss Elements. Discontinued at number 14. Number 13. Finally, we have a fragrance that is still in production. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry to uh, clear my nose in your ear there. Uh, this is a fragrance that is now being marketed by Phallic Fashion Group. Yes, Phallic Fashion Group. But um, I don't know if the bottles have changed or if the house sold or, or what happened. But um, this is a very underrated Again, fresh take on a masculine, fresh, spicy, masculine fragrance, but this is starting, now you're starting to get the ones that are done better, that are executed better in my mind. This is Animal for Men. You might be shocked that this beat out Boss Elements and Ensemble and stuff like that, but I love this fragrance. I think it's extremely underrated, and yes, it is a cheapie. Now, be careful because there's Animal for Men and there's Animal, Animal for Men, as if they couldn't confuse you enough. Um... But this has this very fresh, spicy opening in here. They decided to use lavender, citrus fruits, and again, freesia. Remember I mentioned that they really like using the note of freesia? And they used a narrowly note. And narrowly actually can be a very expensive ingredient to use. Proper, true narrowly is a very expensive uh, ingredient. And the um, freesia actually adds this sort of almost... Um, this shiny tea-like smell to the composition. So imagine this sort of shiny flor floral tea-like smell with the freshness. There's a, there's a very fresh lavender here, not not a not a um, deeper herbal lavender with um, juniper berry, which adds this sort of sprightliness to it. Geranium, uh, which comes off slightly green in this composition, slightly spicy, slightly green, and um, look at the color. Of, of the old school 80s sort of uh, atomizer color, which I absolutely love. And then oak moss, vetiver, and leather in the base. And it's very hard to do a proper narrowly fragrance in my mind. There's really only a handful that I can just rattle off the top of my head that I absolutely love. Rocha's Louis is a, is a take on narrowly, which is uh, very well executed. And you know, there's a handful of Narrowly fragrances. Dunhill Icon is a beautiful take on, on Narrowly. And actually, I would put this in the list, even though this is a cheapie. Some some Narrowly fragrances uh, can come across as having this almost like laundry mat feel, which you would expect from a cheap fragrance like this. You would expect this to be one of the fragrances that comes across as this cheap laundry detergent-like smell. It doesn't. It actually smells really high quality to me. And now, to be fair, I don't know what the Phallic Fashion Group bottles look like. I don't know if they changed the distributed name by, but mine says Animal Group Perfume. So I don't know if the house ended up selling. I know for the longest time, they were like a holdout. While everyone else was selling their brands to LVMH and Estee Lauder and L'Oreal and all this stuff, they just kept sort of pumping out their bottles that they were doing um, and, you know, just sort of, tried to keep to themselves, and I don't know if they finally had to fold and sell the operation to Phallic Fashion Group, hell of a name, by the way, um, or what, but uh, this, is a, this is a really underrated fragrance, but if you um, go in expecting the original, or owed oh, the most popular version of Animal, Animal, Animal for Men, you will be very disappointed with this, because this is more of a fresh, spicy, almost like a fougere smelling fragrance, but kind of going in a little... Uh, fresher direction. Very well done, though. And then, at number 12, we've got a Gerard Anthony, a true master perfumer, and, you know, a perfumer who really has my respect. I really pay close attention when I know Gerard Anthony has worked on something between Azaro Porom, Akitos, and Balenciaga Porom, and this is a fragrance that, in 1993, maybe the, the biggest uh, hole in my collection that you're going to notice is there's no Platinum Ego East. It's not a fragrance that I rate really highly. If I'm going to wear um, this style of perfume, I would just rather wear this. This is XS by Paco Rabanne. And this is what the original packaging of XS looks like. Now, the new ones, they sort of made the bottles stubbier, 
and it still sort of kept this metallic feel. And it's interesting if you really think about, and the original bottles had this almost Zippo lighter like opening. And this is a tester bottle, thanks to the great Anuj. And um, so it's bergamot, coriander, juniper berries with wild flowers. Wild flowers. I don't know how or what wild flowers smells like, but um, I'm sure it has a very distinctive uh, smell with a base of sandalwood, cedarwood, and musk. And so you have to put yourself in 1993 again, a year of transition. And in 1993... Chanel decided to try to salvage what was left left of the name uh, Egoist because the original Egoist was a flop. First, they put out Bois Noir. They thought it sold well enough. They put out a huge Blitz ad campaign, which um, in the Ghost Perfumer book, Gabe o uh, Oppenheim actually says that Chanel spent fifty million dollars on the sh on the Egoist ad campaign. You know, the one where the women are opening up the uh, blinds and yelling, Ego East, Ego East, which basically means like, you egotistical asshole sort of thing. Uh, very brave name, by the way, uh, to, to name your perfume. And so the sales just weren't there. So they decided they were going to get with the times and create a flanker. And Chanel created Platinum Ego East. And of course, if you've seen Platinum Ego East bottle, it comes in that sort of metallic looking bottle cap thing. Uh, and, and this fits right alongside of it this sort of metallic smell. Um, and you know, there is a little bit of a metallic vibe to it. There's a, there's a lot of musks. There's a bit of rosemary, I think, which can make the fragrance smell slightly oily with the woods. And um, Parfumo says there's a corn mint note in the top, which I don't really know how corn mint smells can't pretend to, um, but maybe maybe just like a little bit of this mintiness in the top, you could say. Um, but a really good spicy, woody, sort of fresh fragrance. Is this DNA my favorite? No. But is this competently executed? Yes, absolutely. And it's a, a duo perfumer between Gerard Anthony and the late Rosanne du Matou, who also recently died within the last year or so. So that's XS Porome at number 12. Number 11 is the first fragrance on this list I actually have a full review on, or a video on on the channel. You can go check it out. It is Jill Sander Background. And this is a little mini, So, but if you want to sort of hear my thoughts on Jill Sander, go check out my, my review on it. Uh, background, I thought was a really good fragrance, but I thought it was a little derivative in the fact that uh, Jill Sander Man or Jill Sander Feeling Man, depending on which bottle you have from 1989, did this job better. You know, this felt like they were sort of trying to modernize that Jill Sander DNA, which to their credit, at least they sort of had a house in-house DNA that felt like you know, this uh, similarity that ran up and down throughout the fragrances. And Jill Sander does this type of perfume very well. So it's not that this is a bad fragrance. For me, it was more that already having Feeling Man, I think that that does what this does a little bit better anyways. But I really like how you could pick up bits and pieces of Feeling Man in background. But if you want to hear my thoughts on, on background, go watch my review. And this is discontinued and getting expensive as a lot of discontinued perfumes are. So that is number 11. Number 10. Number 10 is a drugstore fragrance. And it's actually one that really took me by surprise how much I like this. I'm going to dip the little blotter in here because uh, I want to smell this. It's been a while and I need to wear that actually. I need to wear that as my scent of the day very soon. But this is a fragrance that was marketed by Serpy, and um, yeah, so this is a fragrance that I have to thank Jonathan 1970 for turning me on to this one. Really interesting, um, sort of, uh, I guess you could call it a almost like a leathery fougere, spicy, fresh. Uh, this is Pomalato Womo. Discontinued. And I think this was one of those 
One Run Fragrances. This is a 100 uh, ml bottle, and um, it sort of opens up with this fresh uh, fruitiness. And remember how I was saying Jill Sanders has this sort of similarity that runs through their fragrances. One of the things that you notice in both Background and Feeling Man is this raspberry fruitiness. And it almost feels like there's a little bit of this anise slash raspberry fruitiness in Pomolato Uomo as well. Um, but there's a lot of old school, somewhat even barbershoppy feeling. Um, almost like this spicy fresh fougere. So imagine like a fougere, but with this leathery base. All right. Very well done. Very competent. Uh, a little bit of freshness in there, trying to sort of keep up with the times. There's some freshness. It's not all old school, you know, um, but really underrated, I would say, fragrance that really has my attention. I need to wear this and talk some more about it. Uh, really good discontinued gem. Pomalato Uomo uh, at number 10. Number 9. Let me label this, just not that I'll forget, but just so I can... Pomalato... Of course, the pen doesn't work. Pomolato Uomo. Yeah, really good. Um, especially if you like those old school type fougeres. Classically done, but with a little bit of a modern twist, I'd recommend Pomolato Uomo. All right, number nine. Number nine is a Chanel. And there, are, there may be some people that are absolutely... Um, offended that this is not like number one. To be fair, this is probably one of the most classy fragrances on this list, as Chanel usually does. It has that Chanel posh, that Chanel sparkle, that Chanel pop to it. It's just I have a hard time wearing this all the time, um, even though it is extremely elegant smelling. Uh, so what ended up happening is in 1974, Chanel put out a fragrance called Cristal Eau de Toilette. And then in 1993, they put out this, and this is the Eau de Parfum version of Cristal, and this is a vintage bottle. So this is an older bottle with a short ingredient list. Uh, I think Anuj found this one for me. The great Anuj strikes again, and um, very green, fresh, and cold fragrance. Actually, one of the coldest fragrances I think I've ever smelled. Um, it literally is is so cold, it feels like you're almost feeling a, like, uh, if you ever had, like, a piece of metal or something that's on the outside of one of your doors, and in the winter it gets really, really cold, like, you could just put your hand or face on that metal, and you just, you can just feel the metallic coldness of it. Not that this fragrance is necessarily metallic, although that was sort of a trend at the time, so maybe there is a little bit to that, but just think more of the coldness of it. Somehow, there's a little bit of a peach note. And in normal Chanel sort of um, style, they created this very off-putting, not off-putting, but um, almost like I'm here and you're here, right? And you stay there because I'm, I'm here and I'm the boss or whatever it is. Or, you know, these are for, you know, people that uh, are of a certain social structure, let's say a certain social class. And it feels like it, it's a little bit like, you know, you can stand next to me in line at the bank, but uh, do not speak to me. Do not ask any questions, my good sir. And, you know, it's it's a little bit of that. Yes, we are going to get into the Bentley as soon as we get out of line, Mortimer. You know, there's a little bit of this, uh, of this hoity-toity upper-class feel to this fragrance, which I quite like. I like these high-class... Um, expensive smelling blended fragrances, but there's something cold in this, off-putting. Also from, like I said, the metal outside of the door, think of that, but also think of I'm here and you're here, right? And there's also a little bit of this almost like stale cigarette smoke in here, which is very interesting. It makes the fragrance interesting. So, and of course there's that Chanel high-class iris Beautiful iris in here, beautiful oak moss and vetiver. Even though this is marketed towards women, completely unisex. I have no problem wearing this, just like I have no problem wearing number 19. But I, I, I think it's a beautiful fragrance, and um, 
on quality and merits alone, you could say that this could be number one for, for 1993. But for me, this, this is just number nine, um, just because there's so many others from this year that I really love wearing. Okay, so we're going to get into the, into the heart of, of my 1993 list, the meat and potatoes, if you will. Uh, at number eight, it's going to be an Ungaro. And even though I think this is the weakest of the Ungaro Port Lome releases, I've the more I've worn this, the more I've sort of peeled back some of the layers. Like an onion, you peel back the layers, and you start your brain sort of starts to wander and think about some things. This is Ungaro Port Lome 3. And the more I've worn this, believe it or not, the more I can compare this to like a old school Chanel. The, especially the vintage. This is the vintage version. Um, and this one uh, really gives me vibes of almost like the mahogany and this um, wood smell in here. Like you can feel a little bit of egoist in here. The rose reminds me of the way the rose just sort of hauntingly creeps into Antaeus, right? Um, there's just these little hints to... Uh, Jacques Polge and Francois Demachy's creation of Ungaro Port Lome 3, plus that vodka note in the top is just so weird and strange. Um, the, the weakest of the Port Lome offerings, but still very, very interesting. And still getting to know it, I like the lavender and sage combo in the top, and I like that earthiness, the way it sort of dries down. Man, the rose in this is extremely haunting, but beautiful, though. So, Ungaro Por Lorem 3 at number 8. Number 7. Number 7 is one of the most disrespected citrus fragrances ever. Does not get the love and props that it deserves. This is a fragrance that Creed feels like heavily inspired Neroli Sauvage from this perfume. Neroli Sauvage came out in 1994, one year after this. This came out in 1993. If you've ever smelled a vintage bottle of Eau de Rochas Pour Homme, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The modern is still quite nice as well. But if you can get the vintage bottle where it all sort of uh, blends together, cap and all. Also, speaking of bottle, this is almost like you put your fingers on the bottle and waves started to appear. Like you touch the water, just barely, right, with your fingertips and sort of these waves I don't know if you can see the fingerprints in the bottle. It's almost like you put your fingerprints in there and the waves from the from the water just started to spread. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful bottle design. And the fragrance itself is, is also one such fragrance. Um, probably one of the best fresh citrusy fragrances ever created. There's also... Um, this unbelievable floral heart. You have to remember, florals were becoming a big thing for men, right? So they created this lovely citruses, all the citruses under the sun, mandarin orange, lemon, lime, bergamot. There's this lemon vervain. Um, oh, it's so good. There's this lemon vervain aldehydic sort of opening with some herbal basil. And then you have coriander, freesia, again, freesia, the note of 1993. Um, and again, freesia um, sort of adds this tea-like, um, sort of uh, bright tea-like, shining-like feel to the composition. And, um, and then you've got this floral heart, which is out of this world. Jasmine, carnation, lily of the valley, rose, violet, with the freesia. And then you have a base of oak moss, amber, cedar, musk, and vetiver. Giles Ram, uh, Rami made this fragrance. And for me, honestly, value for money, one of the best floral fragrances ever created. Eau de Rochas Pour Homme, um, even in the modern. But if you can find these vintage bottles that, that have held up well, you'll be absolutely blown away. It, it smells better than Neroli Sauvage, actually, in my opinion. Okay, so that is number seven. Number six. Number six is a flanker of YSL Jazz. And it is the Great Jazz Prestige. And if you have seen me show off the box of Jazz Prestige before, you know that they tout Mysore Sandalwood on the box, which in 1993 uh, is a definite possibility. You very well may get 
real Mysore sandalwood, even in designers like this from YSL, and that's exactly what you get in Jazz. So Jazz is sort of a fruitier, playfuller version of its uh, older brother, Jazz from the, from the late 80s. My favorite version of Jazz is the OG Jazz, but this would be runner-up. Um, Jazz Prestige would be runner-up to the, to the throne, and there's a lot of similarities to the original Jazz, um, you know, the way the lavender and anise and everything flows together. They've added a little bit more sort of warmth of benzoin. They took out the tobacco from the original Jazz, um, and they've added this fruitiness, this playfulness. There's a little bit of a, um... You know, this is a little more playful version of, of jazz. If jazz is too serious for you, along came jazz prestige. Because jazz was supposed to be like a fun fragrance. I mean, it's jazz, right? You know, you're listening to jazz or you're out and about enjoying yourself. You know, that was the marketing. Guys walking down the street together, hanging out, partying. You know, if you've seen the advertisements for jazz. Um, and I think even jazz prestige. Yeah, so the, so the advertisement for jazz prestige is like, Two guys, ah, there's a woman in the middle, of course. So there's a woman in the middle, two guys, they're they're dressed kind of somewhat business professional, but the tie is sort of pulled to the side. They've obviously, they're hanging out after work, you know. You can see the buildings of the city behind them. That's the marketing of jazz. It's supposed to be sort of a playful, fun time. Um, and this captures that a little more than the original, even though I really like the original more. Um, jazz is, jazz Jazz Prestige, and Live Jazz. The whole line is discontinued, but um, Jazz and Jazz Prestige are worth hunting down, in my opinion. And just a little bit of a weird off-topic uh, trope I'll mention is if you end up really liking Jazz Prestige, like if you're like, man, this is my favorite of the bunch, check this out. This is uh, Vermeil uh, Pour Homme, and it is fantastic. There's similarities to me between these two fragrances, but this is like a $20 fragrance and this is like a $250 fragrance now because it's discontinued. Okay, number five. Number five on the list. Oh yeah, that Pomolato Womo. Oh, it's, um, it's showing much more of its sort of 80s facet on the blotter. Yeah, it really feels like an 80s fragrance. Love that stuff. What a find that was. Okay, so next on the list, number five. Number five is an Amouage. And this is Amouage Gold Cologne or Gentleman's EDT, as they used to call it. So Gold Cologne or Gentleman's EDT came out in 1993. And... Um, so it's sort of like a powdery cologne version of the OG of Amouage Gold, which came out 10 years before this. So to celebrate the 10 year anniversary, Amouage put out Gentleman's Cologne. Um, and it's basically sort of a, a, like I said, a cologne version of the, of the original. It doesn't have as much of that just powdery grandness. You know, the original from 1983, Gold Man, is like a ballroom fragrance. I mean, it's like, it's, it's literally like, um, uh, imagine crushing up gold into powder and like throwing it up in the air and imagine what that smells like as the powder just drifts back down to earth, right? Imagine smelling that. Imagine if that had a smell, that shimmery sort of, uh, feel of gold luxury opulence, big, huge fragrance. And this tones it down a little bit. This is like, if I wanted to wear gold in the summer, this is what I would wear. I would wear this because this has more of sort of the oranges and citruses and the floral, the, the florals are still there and, and you know, the woods and the amber and the Omani frankincense, which is so beautiful, uh, is still here, but it just doesn't feel as rich and opulent and dense, if that makes sense. So number five, Amouage Gold Cologne or Gentleman's EDT, same thing. Okay, next on the list is number four. And number four is a true unicorn. Impossible to find. Um, and when you do, the people who are selling it think they're like sitting on a lottery ticket. But if you get a chance to smell this, if you like the fragrances like I like that have this leathery, spicy tobacco thing, um, this is a must sniff one time in your life. This is 
Shiseido's Basara. Now, to confuse things even more, it was originally released as Basara. They then changed the name to Basala. Apparently, um, in some countries, it was hard to say Basara, so they changed it to Basala. And um, I wish they never discontinued this. Shiseido had some absolutely banging, absolutely banging fragrances back in the day. And uh, this is lavender, citruses, blossoms. But the, the meat and potatoes of this fragrance is the spices, the tobacco. There's almost like this desert dry spiciness in the background. Imagine... Serge, imagine, um, you know how Andy Tower did his L'Air du Desert Moroccan fragrances, thinking of like flying over the Moroccan desert, right? Imagine Serge Luton, who was very much inspired by Morocco. Imagine Serge Luton creating sort of this desert Moroccan uh, landscape, right? And just making it just absolutely bone dry with the tobacco and the leather sandalwood and amber it is out of this world if you like the way the tobacco is done and something like michael for men by michael coors imagine like a more leathery spicier almost like a niche version of that that could be like a designer version and uh but basara or basala could be a niche version of it it's so good i mean it's almost like fiery good uh, and I think that the bottle was supposed to have this fiery um, feel to it. Yeah, there there were advertisements with like fire in the background and all this stuff. And there's a little bit of that from, from the spices. But for me, it's really more about that dry desert tobacco, leather, and, and woods. So, so good. Easily signature scent worthy. I'll do a review on that one day. Um, so Shiseido's Basara at number four. Number three, number three, and that just goes to show you how much I love number two and number one, is this is uh, my number one amber fragrance. Number one amber. So it doesn't make it number one on the 1993 list, but this is my number one amber fragrance, and it is Serge Luton's Ombre Sultan. So luckily I've got a couple bottles of this. I never want to be without this. This is my lifelong amber. Uh, one of my one of the best ambers I've ever smelled. My favorite amber of all time. It is absolutely perfection. I don't know how you improve on this as an amber fragrance. I mean, it literally, all of the dials, everything that needs to be in an amber fragrance, all of it is just perfectly dosed here. The amber and the vanilla and the cystus labdanum. And um, there's this... Almost like this grandmother's spice cabinet feel in the opening. So when you first spray, it's a spicy amber. But the spices feel like there was some love to them. You know, like they sat in not just any cabinet, but your grandmother's cabinet. And you know how some grandma, some grandmothers have spices that I swear to God have been in there for like 50 years. They just never cleaned it out, right? And And the, and the smell just like tattooed itself in the cabinet so even when you take everything out you, you can just smell that smell forever there's just you're never going to get that smell out of that cabinet that's what the spiciness in the opening smells like to me it's so comforting and familiar and um i, I just absolutely love it i think it's uh i think it's brilliance when it comes to amber um and and that just goes to show how much i love number two and number one that this ended up being number three the best amber fragrance of all time, yes, but um, but yeah, I couldn't uh, could not put this any higher because number two and number one just eked it out a little bit. But man, if you if you're an amber lover, Ombre Sultan is a must sniff. Okay, next on the list, number two, and number two is a, a fragrance that I have a video on on my channel. And ended up being a comparison video between the Eau de Parfum and the Eau de Toilette. But still, obviously, it's like a good enough for a full review. But it ended up being a comparison video between these two. Uh, and this is Escada Pour Homme. So Escada Pour Homme is my favorite Escada fragrance of all time. 
really sad this is discontinued. And I would love a, a big backup bottle of the Eau de Toilette, but hey, I mean, you know, you have to be happy with what you have. And I am very happy to have the juice that I have. I think I actually prefer the, the Eau de Toilette, but go watch my review if you want to know why. So, um, Ascata Pour Homme is a take on this Amber Fougere, is what I'm ending up calling it. It's hard to classify, because it's sort of like a woody oriental Amber Fougere, whatever you want to call it. But, um... They decided to take that DNA of, you know, so many fragrances that came before that I absolutely love. So think of Ungaro Pour Lom, number one. Think of Guerlain's Heritage, right? You could even throw in YSL Jazz and some others to the mix. Um, you know, that that style that I that I just love of Amber Fougeres. And they decided to add their own little twist to it. And that twist, in this case, was the note of Cognac. So there's a brilliant cognac, liqueur, uh, celebratory like note in the opening. Imagine just sitting down having just one of the best glasses of cognac in your life. An expensive, brilliant glass. Everything's perfect. The temperature, the taste, um, the setting, the atmosphere, your mood. And that's what this fragrance feels like to me. It feels like you just close the big deal. You know, you, um, you're the one who... Uh, hit the ho winning home run or whatever analogy you want to make and it just it just has that feel to it And then you enjoy your brilliant glass of cognac. Oh, it's just fantastic. Oh, I love this stuff Oh, so good uh, Easily could be a signature scent for me a Scott a poor moment number two and and that leaves numero uno so uh, number one there's no doubt this was number one for me because even though this fragrance was released in 1993 at heart, this is a 1983 fragrance. It just is. Uh, that's the DNA of it. It's an animalic fragrance, too. It can compete with the Furios and the Koroses and the Anteuses. It really does. Uh, it really has no business coming out in 1993. But that's what makes this fragrance so brilliant and beautiful because the House of Rocco Barocco really said, we don't give a fuck about trends. We're going to go our own way. This is what we want to release, and so we're releasing it. And they did. And it is Joint Pour Homme. This is my 50 mil bottle. I also have a 100 mil bottle, thank God, because I never want to be without this scent. Um, this is the Hescanas distributor. There's also another one called P2 or, or 2P Parfums. I forget which one. Don't worry about distributors. They're both fantastic. Uh, this has this... It gets compared to... Um, Furio because the bottle colors are similar, but um, it's got a little bit of Lapidus Porom in there. It has a little bit of Koros in there. It opens up very green. It's like a, imagine like a green version of Koros with lots of mugwort and basil and um, honey. There's a brilliant note of honey in here, an 80s style honey. So if you like the honey in things like Marbert Man or Hugo Boss Number no. 1, or, you know, these honey, 80s honey style fragrances, Lapidus Pour Homme, you have to check out your, uh, Joint Pour Homme. It is absolutely stunning. And the civet in the base, the leather, the tobacco, all the notes I love. Just this masculine, just blur of, uh, of just beauty. I love this stuff. Absolutely me to a T. This is uh, the kind of stuff I love to wear. And, um, I mean, I wear this, I wear this to, I'll wear this to work. I will wear this out and about. It doesn't matter to me. I think I can, I can pull these type of fragrances off. You do have to have a certain amount of confidence because this fragrance will wear you if you let it. Um, but I love these animalic, especially that old school honey. It's so, so good. There was just no doubt this was going to be number one. Uh, even with my favorite Amber of all time being in here, you know, this still takes the crown for me because this is the, this is my type of perfume. And um, if you're an animalic perfume lover, check out Joint Pour Homme. So that is my ranked 1993 countdown. We did it in about an hour. I uh, appreciate everyone watching. Do leave a comment. Let me know what your favorites are. Let me know what else I should sniff from 1993. I have not smelled before. And uh, look forward to seeing your faces in the comments. Cheers, guys. And I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.